Okay, welcome back. Today, as promised, we, or now as promised, we're going to look at spanning trees. Okay, we'll remind ourselves about the graphs in a second. So one of the advantages um, of trees is that they give us a few simple ways to travel through a set of vertices in a graph. If a connected graph is not a tree, then we can still use these traversal algorithms that we're going to learn about if we identify a subgraph that is a tree. Okay? So given any connected graph G, there will always be a subgraph of that connected graph that is a tree. Okay, so remember, folks, connected graphs have trees. That's important. So if we want to use the subgraph to tell us how to visit all the vertices, then we want our subgraph to include all the vertices. We call such a tree a spanning tree. Okay, so what is a spanning tree? It's a tree, it's a subgraph of a graph that is a tree. Okay, so it turns out that every connected graph has a tree. So let's formally define it. It says here, given a connected graph G, so that's a condition. A spanning tree of G is a subgraph of G, which is a tree and includes all the vertices of G. Okay, so it must be a connected graph. So we say spanning graph is a subgraph of this graph that contains all the vertices of the initial graph. Okay, then we call it the spanning tree. So every connected graph has one. Now, we're going to look at a few algorithms that we can use to find spanning trees. Okay, but before we go there, let us just look at the definitions again. What is a tree? A tree is a connected graph in which there are no cycles or circuits, as other books call them. So it can be simply called an undirected acyclic connected graph. An important property of a tree is that every pair of nodes in a tree has exactly one path between them. Okay, so trees don't have loops. Trees don't have repeated paths. Okay, so what does it say a spanning tree is? Well, a spanning tree, given that you have a connected graph, a spanning tree is a tree whose vertex set is exactly the same as the initial graph G. And the edge set is a subset, or it might also be equal to the amount of edges that there were in the original graph. Okay, so information, informally speaking, a spanning tree is a tree T formed by deleting some of the edges on the initial graph G, but preserving the fact that every two nodes on the resultant graph has a path between them. Okay, now what we're going to look at is looking at minimum spanning trees today. What is a minimum spanning tree? Well, some trees or some graphs will have weights assigned to each of its edges. That weight could be the cost of delivering something from node A to node B. It might also be the distance between two nodes, which can represent the distance between towns if you're traveling. What's the difference between Buenos Aires and Johannesburg in South Africa? What's the distance between South Africa and New York if you want to visit a few countries? You can draw a graph with that, but that's called a weighted graph. So each edge will have a number on it, and we're going to call that the weight of the edge. Okay, so what does a minimum spanning tree do? A minimum spanning tree is a graph that can have multiple spanning trees. Adding weights to edges of graphs make them more interesting, which can lead us to asking optimal questions. So what is the shortest distance that I have to travel if I visit all these cities? How must I visit the cities so that I travel the least distance? Or if it's cost to get from one place to the next, 
how must I travel to minimize my cost? Okay, these are called optimal problems. These are highly useful in networking and so on. Okay, so let us look at what I have prepared for us. The first thing, just to make sure you understand, is the idea of spanning. Okay? Spanning is the difference. A spanning subgraph is a subgraph which has the same vertex set of the original graph. A spanning tree, as per the definition in our question, is a, it's a tree that is spanning. Okay? Contains all the vertices. It does not necessarily contain all the edges. So, for example, we have this graph given to us. It has a spanning tree that looks like this. It's a subgraph of the original graph in terms of the edges. All the vertices are there. Okay, so a tree contains all the vertices of the original graph, and so does a spanning tree. Whereas this subgraph is not a spanning tree because it does not contain this vertex down here. Okay? It is a tree though, but it's not a spanning tree. Okay. This graph over here, if we look at the initial one, is this graph without those two um, lines. But this is not a tree. Why is it not a tree? Well, a tree doesn't have a cycle in it. Okay? So it is spanning, but it's not a tree. A tree is a subgraph without cycles or circuits in it. Okay, so let's continue and let's look at a few ideas that relate to what we just spoke about. Just to remind ourselves, what is a connected graph? We have connected or disconnected graphs and we have something that we're going to call bridges. Okay? Very important. So this graph here, just imagine for now that that line is indeed drawn, is a connected graph. Meaning, you can get from any vertex to any other vertex. Okay, the moment we remove that line from the graph, we have a disconnected graph. And the line we have removed is called a bridge. Okay, so in some of the graphs, like the ones following, you have a connected graph. But that's a bridge, this is a bridge, that is a bridge, and that is a bridge. If you remove those bridges, you are forming three disconnected graphs. If you remove these two, you have a connected graph over here, and the whole graph is disconnected because those two bridges were removed. So if a side, if you remove it, takes a connected graph and it changes it into a disconnected graph, that side is called a bridge. Okay, this here is not a connected graph because vertex zero is not connected to the rest of the graph. So if we want to connect it, we need to create a bridge there. Or here even, if we remove, just remove that side, then we have two vertices that are disconnected from the original graph. So we have a disconnected graph in total. Now folks, that is important and you need to remember these things. Okay, the first thing I'm going to look at now is, for in terms of spanning trees, are the algorithms that we learn about. The first algorithm is called Kruskal's Minimum Spanning Tree Algorithm. It's a greedy algorithm. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do we need mean by a greedy algorithm? A greedy algorithm is any algorithm that follows a problem-solving heuristic of making the local optimum choices at each stage you make a choice with the intent of finding a global optimum. Now remember that optimum can be a maximum or a minimum. We don't know. But let's talk about how many edges does a minimum spanning tree have? Well, if there's five vertices, those five vertices are going to be joined by a minimum of 
four edges. Okay, so a minimum spanning tree has V minus one edges, where V is the number of vertices in the given graph. Now, please, folks, that is very important. Note that down somewhere, so that in a minimum spanning tree, you have one less edge than what you have vertices. Then you know it's a minimum spanning tree. Now that is of course related, it will be the case as well whether the graph is weighted or not. Okay, so I think at this point let's quickly just look at the graphs that they've shown us in our textbook. If I look at those two graphs there, okay, we've got a graph given here, it's a complete graph, okay. Is it a connected graph? No, because not every, or it is a connected graph rather, not a complete graph. It would have been complete if every vertex is connected to every other vertex. Okay, so here is a spanning tree. It's a subgraph of the original graph, and it contains all the vertices. Here's another spanning tree. It has all the vertices of the initial graph, but we've cut a few edges so that each edge or each pair of edges here are connected with a minimum of one um, edge. Then that is known as a spanning um, tree. Okay, so let's return to what it is that I want us to look at, and that is the very first graph that I've got over there. Okay, how does Kruskal's algorithm work? We're working with Kruskal's algorithm. It finds a minimum cost spanning tree. So what does it say we must do? It says sort all the edges in a non-decreasing order of their weight. So in an increasing order, starting with the smallest to the biggest. We're going to sort them on the side. Then we're going to pick the smallest edge first. Check if it forms a cycle with a spanning tree formed so far. If the cycle is not formed, then we include this edge, else we discard it. So <clears throat> this is going to be an iteration. We're going to repeat the, this step until we have a total of V minus 1 edges um, that we have chosen to work with. Okay, so I've got my graph drawn here on this piece of paper for us. Let's have a look at it. There's the graph, and we're going to apply the algorithm. Okay, so we're going to write down the edges in order of their size. So I'm going to call this edge 7, 6. It has a weight of 1. The next highest weight is edge 6, 5. That has a weight of 2. Okay, the next weight there is 2, 8 or 8, 2. It can work any way or any direction. That also has a weight of 2. Okay, the next biggest weight looks like it's going to be 0, 1. 0, 1, which has a weight of 4. Is there another 4? No. The next weight, oh, there is another 4. 2, 5 has a weight of 4. Then if we look at the next highest weight, it seems to be 6. That will be 8, 6. We'll have a weight of 6. Then we have two weights that are 7s. So we have 7, 8 with a weight of 8. No, sorry, of 7. So this is the weight and that is the edge. Okay? just to remind us what we're doing. Okay, so there's another weight, edge with a weight of 7, and that is the edge 2, 3. Also has a weight of 7. Then we have two edges with weight 8. So 1 and 2 has a weight of 8, and then 0 and 7 has a weight of 8. Okay, so what are we doing? Just a reminder, Crisco tells us, Order them from smallest to largest. We're looking for a minimum spanning tree. 
and the spanning tree includes all the vertices of the initial graph, but it only includes the edges with the least weight, provided there's no cycles formed. Okay, so let's continue. We're at 8. I don't think there's another 8. Then we have 9. The edge 3, 4 has a weight of 9. Okay, there's a not another 9. There's a 10. So the edge 5, 4 has a weight of 10. And then we have a weight of 11 at 1 and 7. Now you can see why we call this a greedy algorithm. It takes some time to do this job. Okay, so 11, there's no 12, there's no 13. And then the last edge is 3, 5, which gives us 14 as a weight. Now he says, you start with the edge with the least weight, which is 7, 6. Okay, 7, 6 here, we're going to definitely use... 7, 6, it's in our graph. Okay, then the next weight we have is either 6, 5 or 2, 8. Okay, so we can choose. We might just include both of them. I think let's include both because they don't form a cycle. So 2, 5 we've chosen and we're going to choose um, 2, 8. If we look at what we've chosen so far, we have not yet formed a cycle or a circuit. Okay, so, so far, so good. We go to 4, which is 0, 1. Now, 0, 1 lies over there, and 2, 5 is also a 4, and 2, 5 lies over there. Not one of them forms a cycle, so I'm going to include 2, 5, and I'm going to include... What did we say? 0, 1, which also has a 4, a weight of 4. So, so far, we find. Now, I just want us to look at the vertices we've included so far. Let's highlight them. We have vertex 7. We've got vertex 8 in. We've got vertex 2. We've got vertex 6. We've got vertex 5. We have naught and we have one in it. Okay, so we have a choice now. Our next weight, or height, or weight rather, is 8, 6. Now folks, if I take the side 8, 6, I am forming a circuit. If that side is chosen, I have that as a circuit. So I'm not going to use 8, 6. I go to the next one. 7, 8. Okay, where's 7? Vertex 7 is here, vertex 8 is there. Now, if I choose 7, 8, folks, you can see that then I will have a circuit. So, I'm also not going to choose 7 and 8 because 7, the, the edge 7, 8, because it will form a circuit. It's for the same reason that I did not choose. 8 and 6. Okay, so we continue to 2, 3. Well, where's vertex 2? There's vertex 2, there's vertex 3, and it does not form a cycle or a circuit, so I'm going to choose that one. I now have used the vertex 3 over there. Now, remember, I'm looking for a minimum spanning tree over here. Okay, so at some stage I need to make a choice because here we are still not connected. This is still disconnected here. So let's continue on. Now the next choices I can make is 1, 2 and 0, 7. They both have a weight of 8. Now if I go 0, 7, I'm choosing 8. Okay. If I go 1, 2, I'm choosing 8. So I'm spoiled for choice over here. I can choose any one of those two sides because they have an equal weight. Now, let's see, do they form a circuit? If I choose this one, no, it doesn't form a circuit. If I choose that one, it still doesn't form a circuit. So I'm just going to be funny and I'm going to choose 1, 2. The first one that came up. 
Okay, so the only vertex that is left for us to connect is vertex 4. So I'm not going to use the path north 7, no. Am I going to use the path 3, 4? No, because, oh yes, let's have a look. 3, 4 is the path that I'm looking for, and it has a weight of 9. So there's my last edge that I am going to select. So if I draw this spanning tree, it has all the initial vertices in it. Okay, so if I draw the spanning tree here, I'm just going to draw the edges. Uh, I'm not going to put the, the numbers in for the vertices. Okay, we had a vertex here, a vertex here, and a vertex there. So our minimum spanning tree had that in. It had the side 8 in. It had 7 in here. It had a weight of 9 there, a weight of 2 to get there, a weight of 4 to get here, a weight of 1, and a weight of 2. So what is the weight of my MST, my minimum spanning tree? The weight is simply just the sum of all these weights. So that gives me 12 plus 7 is 19, 19 plus 9 is 28, 29, 30, 36, 37. Okay, folks, so that is applying Kruskal's algorithm to get to a minimum spanning tree. Now, remember here I was spoiled for choice. I could have gone either this way or I could have gone that way. As long as the result at the end of the day is a tree. What is a tree again? A tree, a spanning tree, contains all the vertices of the initial graph. A spanning tree does not contain all the edges. It, we work only with the edges that has minimum weight. Okay, let's look at another example here. We've got another example that's listed here for us. So let's see if we apply Kruskal's algorithm to this. Let us write the edges in orders of their weight. So ED has a weight of 2. That's the smallest weight. Then AB follows. AB has a weight of 3. Then AE follows. And AE has a weight of 4. CD is the next one. I could have listed them either way. CD first and then AE, doesn't matter, as long as I have them both on my list. Okay, so we had 4, then 5 is EF and BC, both have weights of 5. Okay, so I fill in those two weights there, I see my weights 5 and 5, the next one is 6, which is FC, the next weight is 7, which is AF, and then I have two weights of 8. BF has a weight of 8, and so does FD have a weight of 8. So let's start with our first um, edge with minimum weight. That edge is edge ED. Okay, so there we go. Then we have a second edge AB. So, so far we haven't formed any cycles yet, so, so far so good. AE is 4. Now, AE lies where? There's AE. It's 4. Or I could use CD. Okay, whichever one I want to use, as long as I don't have a cycle. Now, in this case, I'm going to use both. I'm going to use both AE and I'm going to use CD because I don't have a cycle. So now, the only thing that's left is to get to vertex F. Now that I can do by following EF. And there's my minimum spanning tree by Kruskal's algorithm. Okay, we applied Kruskal. The weight then of my minimum spanning tree in this case is going to be 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 4 plus 5. 
Let's just count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 vertices. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 edges. Perfect. 4 plus 2 is... Uh, 8 plus 2 is 10. Plus that gives me a total weight for this optimal minimum spanning tree of 18. I think you get quite a good idea how easy this works. Okay, so let's look at one last example using Crisco. Okay, so here we've got a fictional town for Hobbit Town because you can see the distances are quite short. These are all in meters. And we want to find out how are we going to create a pathway that we take with minimum distances or the minimum yeah, spanning tree for this particular town. Now there's no roads between Tom's Diner and the City Hall, no roads between McFain's Farm and Dry Cleaners, but there's a road that you can go around. Okay, so let us start and let's look at, we're not even going to list, we're just going to work on our graph. Okay, there's two edges with fives, minimum edges. Okay, so I've got five plus five so far. The next highest weight here is seven. Okay, so that's between the brewery and the inn. Okay, I've got a seven. Then the next weight after five and seven, that's the smallest, seem to be ten. Okay, there's two tens. Well, if I use that ten and I use this ten, I still have not formed a cycle. Okay, so I've got the two tens in on the Criscoll algorithm. The next highest number that I have to get is 12, I think. Yeah, after 10, it's 12. So if I choose this side here, folks, you can see I still have not formed a cycle. Okay, so let's just take stock here. I've had those that I've already gone through. Okay, but I have a disconnected graph. There, those two vertices stand loose from the rest. So let's go on. 12, let's go to the next highest, which is 15. So that connects McFain's farm with Tom's diner. So we're happy with that. We can add a 15 to our weight. And then the, here is our next 15 over there. So there is our minimum spanning tree for this imaginary town. Okay, what are the distances? Well, there's 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. The total weight is 79. So the minimum spanning tree weight that we have is 79 meters. Okay, folks, uh, yeah, that is our second last. Let me just have a look. I think it's our second last. Might just be our last one. Let's just see on, on Chris Carl's algorithm. Okay, so we've dealt with that one. We've dealt with that one. We've dealt with that one. And now we're going to teach you something that um, has to do with matrices. Okay, we are going to look at minimum spanning trees of a directed graph. And the graph that we're going to look at is the graph that's on the screen at the moment. But let's just make this a little bit more formal than what we had up to now. We define a graph G with a vertex set and an edge set. Okay, so let that graph be an undirected graph. Now, an undirected graph is like a one-way street. You can get from A to B only by starting at A and going to B. Because it's a one-way. You can't come back B, A. That is what we talk about. Sorry, if we talk about an undirected graph. Okay, so it's an undirected, connected, weighted graph on your screen. 
with n vertices, where V is the set of vertices, E is the set of edges, and W is the set of weights or costs associated with each of the edges. So we have a vertex set, an edge set, and a weight set. Where EIJ, the edge adjacent to the vertices VI and VJ. So if I talk about edge IJ, I'm talking about the two vertices VI and VJ, which form the edge. WIJ is the weight that will be associated with that edge. Okay? The weight matrix of, haha, look at what's happening, of the graph G is constructed as follows. If there is an edge between the vertices V and J in the G in the graph, then the set MIJ we record its weight. Else, if there is no uh, edge joining the two, then we record the weight of that edge as zero. Now folks, here's our graph. What I've done is I have drawn it for us on a piece of paper so that we can work with the idea that we are facing now. The idea we're facing is called an adjacency matrix. Okay, now an adjacency matrix is a matrix we're going to draw up that has all these edges, okay, as columns and as rows. So we're going to have, let's just n n name them like they did, vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3, vertex 4, vertex 5, vertex 6, and vertex 7. And here we'll have vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3. Vertex 4, Vertex 5, Vertex 6, Vertex 7. So adjacency matrices are always square matrices. Okay, now remember what it said. If between a vertex and another vertex there is an edge, you record that edge's weight in the adjacency matrix. Okay? Adjacency means the vertices are adjacent to each other and we can record the weight. Okay, so hello, one and one, it's the same vertex. So between vertex one and vertex one and vertex two, is there an edge? Definitely, that edge has a weight of 28. Okay, so that will be the same for vertex two and vertex one. So there's a 28 recorded over here as well. Is there an edge between vertex 1 and vertex 3? There's no edge. Between vertex 1 and vertex 4? No, so we record a 0. Between vertex 1 and vertex 5? No, so we record a 0. Okay, and then between vertex 1 and 6, definitely there's an edge, so that has a weight of 10. Between 1 and 7, there's nothing. Now, folks, we're going to continue with that down here. Between 6 and 1, there was an edge with weight 10. Between 7 and 1 and 1 and 7, there was none. Okay, so the first row and the first column has been taken care of in our adjacency matrix. Okay, so let us go for the second. Vertex 2, vertex 2, there's no pathway, it's the same vertex. Remember, trees or graphs, this graph doesn't have a loop in it. If there was a loop and that loop had weight, that wouldn't have had weight because it's just showing you returning to 2. So the weight in any case is not. Okay, between 2 and 3, is there an edge? Yes, between 2 and 3, there's an edge which is 16. So between 3 and 2, that edge will still be present. Okay, between 2 and 7. So now you can see, I'm just going to look at those that are connected to the vertex where I am. Between 2 and 7, there's a weight of 14. So between 7 and 2, there will still be a weight of 14. So vertex 2 is only adjacent to 1, to 3, and to 7. So we record zeros in the other columns 
because it's not connected to it. So let's go to vertex 3. Vertex 3 is connected to 2. We've already recorded that. 3 connected to 4. Definitely. 3 is of uh, 3 to 3 is not. 3 to 4 is a weight of 12. And so 4 to 3 will also carry a weight of 12. F is there a, another vertex that it's joined to? Absolutely not. 3 is only joined to 4 and 2. So for the rest, we record the zeros that they told us in our uh, definition of the algorithm that we're applying. Okay, so now we go to 4. 4 is connected to itself. Beautiful. So we put a naught there. Okay, so what now? 4 and 5. Is 4 connected to 5? 22. Yes. So 5 and 4 will be connected. Okay, it's also connected to 7 by a weight of 18. So there's a weight of 18. And 7 and 4 has a weight of 18 over here. It's also connected to 5, and we've already recorded that. So vertex 4 is connected to 3 vertices. 1, 2, 3. The rest of it are zeros. Okay, we go to the next vertex. By 5 and 5, we record a naught. Okay, because that's where 5 and 5 intersects. 5 has is connected to 4 to 7 and to 6. So we must have uh, three entries in that row, row. So 5 is connected to 6 with a weight of 25. So 6 will be connected to 5 with a weight of 25. 5 is also connected to 7 with a weight of 24. Okay, So 7 will be connected to 5 with the same weight. And that's done. That takes care of 5. Let's go to 6. 6 is connected to 2 only, to vertex 1 and vertex 5. Vertex 1 and vertex 5, the rest of these will be zeros. And then 7 and itself has a weight of naught. Now, folks, if you look at this, let me just get my ruler. Where is my ruler so that I draw proper lines? On the diagonal of this matrix, we have a zero. The entries above is identical to the entries below. So I'm going to start using the above entries to populate and to find the minimum cost spanning tree. Okay, if I start at the first one, I have a number 10. Okay, 10 connects vertex 1 and 6. Okay, so vertex 1 and 6 will form part of the graph. Then the very next or the highest number is the number 12. If I look at 12 over here, it connects 3 and 4. Okay, so 12 is connected by 3 and 4. No cycles yet. Okay, so you can see I'm running down those numbers. 14 connects 2 and 7 over here. That's the next highest number will be 14, it connects 2 and 7. So I'm happy with that one. Okay, the next number, the very next num highest number is 16. Now 16 connects 1 and 3. There's 1, sorry, 16 connects 2 and 3. So if I choose to use 16, 16 connects 2 and 3. Okay, so now the very next number is 18, which is this one over here. It connects 4 and 7, but oopsie. If I connect 4 and 7 over there, then I have formed a cycle. So I'm not going to use that one. I record a 0 there for the weights. Okay, the very next one after 18 is 22. Now 22 I can use. If I choose 22, it lies between 4 and 5. Okay, so so far the only one I haven't visited all of, I've got there and I've got, I've visited all these vertices. So I now have a choice for my next one. 
If I choose 24, and because it is the next highest there, 24 will connect 5 and 7, which will form a circuit. So I'm not going to use 24. Okay? The next one in my line is 20, 25. So if I choose 25, 25 connects 5 and 6, so there is my spanning tree from my adjacency matrix. So what will we ask you? Classically here we'll say, use an adjacency matrix to find the minimum cost spanning tree. So the weight of this minimum cost spanning tree is the sum of all of these. So that is 24 plus here we have 28 plus here we have 47. So that gives me what? 40 plus 20 plus 20 is 80 plus 19. It's 12 plus 7. And that gives me a weight of 99 for this um, particular problem where we worked with an adjacency matrix to find the minimum cost spanning tree. Okay, folks, I hope that that taught you something. When we come back in our next video, we are going to look at another algorithm, Prim's algorithm, for finding um, a minimum cost spanning tree. What we'll also do is we'll work with another graph with an adjacency matrix, so you can see and get that under your belt. Okay, folks, that takes care of this video. If you learned something, please like the video and also subscribe to my channel.